I think it's all, only fitting that we give another round of applause for Ezemo. <laughs> Ezemo, I've been told to tell you that uh, you will meet again next year at the Village Square. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Jumoke Oduwole. <laughs> Dr. Jumoke Oduwole is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, and is currently, oh, okay, you didn't like. <laughs> Great are cockites. <laughs> All right, we're many. Okay, and is currently a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government at Musava Romani Center for Business and Government in the USA. In 2022, she was invited to serve as a governance advisor to MIT's GovLab Governance Inici um, Innovation Initiative based on her track record as a champion of innovation in governance. Dr. Oduwale served the Buhari administration from 2015 to 2023, first as senior special assistant to the president on industry, trade, and investment, where she was instrumental in the conceptualization and formation of the Nigerian Office for Trade Negotiations and, and also as a special advisor to the president on ease of doing business. She was the pioneer executive secretary of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, PEBEC, with a mandate to make Nigeria a progressively easier place to do business. She has recently been appointed as a special advisor to the president on PEBEC and investments in the office of the vice president. In 2013, Professor Oduwale was appointed as the holder of the Prince Claus Chair, a visiting professorship in development and equity. She is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Mandela Institute of Development Studies Minds, an Africa-wide think tank on governance and economic development. A 2013 Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellow, Dr. Oduwale holds four law degrees from the University of Lagos Cambridge University, and Stanford University. Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, yes, please. A round of applause is very fitting. Dr. Jumoke was awarded member of the Order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in recognition of her various contributions to nation building. She's obviously passionate about nation building through economic development and has consistently mentored Nigerian youth in various capacities over the past two decades. Dr. Duwale enjoys street photography and is happily married with two beautiful children. Welcome with me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please sit. I think every single time I listen to my profile being read publicly. I just remember the glory and the faithfulness of God over my life, because that is the journey. Um, okay. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. And um, it's been simply a stellar lineup of speakers a lot of like minds, a lot of common themes I've been seeing emerging. I've listened to all the sessions. And similar, but I want to take it in a slightly different direction. So, Africa rising. Is Nigeria on the move? Why did a pastor 16 years ago, decided to start hosting sessions on nation building. 34 sessions, can that be? I can't believe it. <laughs> Covenant Nation, I cannot believe it. That is called staying power. What was his motivation? How did, what did he hope to accomplish? And what has he learned in the journey? Interestingly, his congregation bought into the vision. And today, the platform is perhaps the largest with over 20,000 attendees and reaching hundreds of thousands of viewers across the world. One of the most influential and relevant spaces for sharing ideas with a lot of liberty on nation building for Nigerians. 
When my family and I lived in the United States for some years before returning in 2010, my husband and I had a standing joke that where two or three Nigerians are gathered, Nigeria venting is there in our midst. Seriously, <laughs> consciously or, or subconsciously, the conversation inevitably gravitated to a passionate dissection of the plight of our country. It never failed to happen. It is essentially the same here at home. Nigerians, home and abroad, talk a lot about Nigeria. Yet over the decades, things appear to have remained unchanged, and many would argue that, in fact, we are in worse shape than we were at the time this medium was initiated in 2007. So why then do we still gather, year in, year out, at significant cost to our host, the Covenant Nation, and time to ourselves to discuss and rediscuss critical issues pertaining to the development of our country? If we, and here I mean many Nigerians I listen to, remain pessimistic most of the time, complain about our leaders, and vent about the state of the nation, then why are we here or tuned in yet again, listening to each speaker today, perhaps looking for some ray of hope to cling to? I have a hypothesis. You know I'm an academic. I suspect it is because of love of country. So my big hypothesis is that Nigerians love Nigeria. Nigerians truly love Nigeria. Deep down, even the strongest skeptics or the most angry citizens still believe in the Nigerian dream. Illogical as it may seem, it's hard not to. Today, having established for myself the starting premise of love of country by this significant audience, I have a few questions to ask of you individually, and a few short and hopefully helpful insights to share with you towards the actualization of the Nigeria we all wish to see. So taking a step back, one of the renowned Nigerian authors, and you just heard this a second ago, Chino Achebe's most famous quote, one of his most famous quotes that you hear, even internationally, is the Igbo proverb that tells us a man who does not know where the rain began to beat him cannot know where he dried his body. Just embodying the significance of history and veracity of truth and really taking time to understand what has happened in this country and how we get to here. And not just this country, the continent as a whole. So from the hopeless continent, in the year 2000, The Economist published a cover page titled The Hopeless Continent, painting a bleak picture of a region ravaged by war, famine, and disease amidst the sustained global negative narrative describing the region as corrupt and poverty-ridden. Fast forward a decade, Africa rising. In the early 2010s, the world started recognizing Africa's growth potential and predicting the continent would follow the footsteps of the Asian tigers, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, by December 2011, a decade after its first piece, The Economist stunned the world by featuring a, a cover entitled Africa Rising, basically reversing its own precedent, with an illustration of a boy flying a rainbow-colored kite, the shape of the continent. The accompanied piece entitled Africa's Hopeful Economies, The Sun Shines Bright. The article mentioned Alhaji Aliko Dangote as the richest black person overtaking Oprah Winfrey and described the success of highly motivated entrepreneurs and increasingly prosperous customers patronizing the Onitsha market. Referred to as the world's largest with trade 
from all over the Gulf of Guinea before recognizing Ghana, Ethiopia, Mozambique among the world's fastest growing economies of the time. Similarly, in 2012, Art Rival, the Time magazine, published a cover also titled Africa Rising, describing the continent's rapid economic growth in the face of numerous challenges. The publication highlighted the attraction of $200 million to Africa Focused Equity Fund from Bob Gadoff's Life Aid, a testament to Africa's improving business environment. Now, the optimism and the potential of others looking in on the continent, was it well placed? What others saw, African lions on the move. In June 2010, according to McKinsey and Company's Global Institute, Africa's economy grew very little during the last two decades of the 20th century. But sometime in the late 1990s, the continent began to spur. GDP growth picked up and then rebounded ahead, rising faster and faster through 2008. Today, while Asian tiger economies continue to expand rapidly, we foresee the potential of economic lions in Africa's future. Now, McKinsey's Global Institute does not issue fickle publications. This was based on empirical studies, and they issued the first report. They issued a second report, Lions on the Move 2.0. The roar got louder. With the World Economic Forum estimating economic growth rate for Sub-Saharan Africa to be above 5% in 2014, with Nigeria and Ghana expected to achieve higher than this average. Nigeria was Africa's biggest economy at the time. The World Bank also projected a growth rate of 5.2% in 2014, a rise from 4.7% in 2013, attributing this to improved political stability, security, strong investment growth, and natural resources, infrastructure, and household spending. Africa flourished with buoyancy in resource-rich countries such as Sierra Leone, Congo DRC, a stable economic growth in Cote d'Ivoire, as well as a resuscitation in Mali. Non-rich countries, non-resource-rich countries such as Ethiopia and Rwanda also experienced significant economic growth. Capital flows reached 3.5% of regional GDP in 2023, above developing country average. Now, let me move on a bit from the statistics. It went on to talk about tourism, education. This was 2010s. Where is Africa today? Regional statistics, Sub-Saharan African growth, 4.1% in 2021, dropped to 3.6% in 2022, expected to dip further to 3.1% in 2023. Yes, there's been COVID, there's been um, global uh, economy sluggishness, there's been the war in Ukraine, other contributory factors, we all know them, inflation, high debt. I also have the statistics for Central and West, West and Central Africa, East and Southern Africa. We know the contributory factors. Energy crisis around the globe, South Africa. I'll spare you some of the data. Just to say that this potential was unmet. And what are the reasons why this actuality has eluded us and still eludes us? This is where we get very animated as a people, and we all know the problems only too well. Insecurity, political instability, ethnic tensions, competition for scarce resources, corruption and bad governance, leading with apathy and lack of trust between many African governments and their citizens coup d'etats have resurfaced and is now a common occurrence in Africa, particularly Francophone West and Central Africa, all on top of Nigeria. It's like a line of the coups that have happened in the last three years, about seven of them, further destabilizing the political landscape. Underdeveloped human capital, we've heard more talk earlier 
about education, lack of access to health, insufficient economic opportunities, a lot of jack buying. COVID-19 did a number of the whole world. I think we were actually spared uh, relatively compared to a lot of other regions. But other global factors like the war in Ukraine also heightened the situation. All of the above have manifested in stunted economic growth and the inability of most African countries to attain their clear potential as predicted over a decade ago. And Nigeria today, with everything currently going on in the country that we are all, all too aware of, should we be asking this question? Actually, we, yes, we should be asking this question. Um, but what I'd like to say is that, as young people sometimes say in response to their relationship status nowadays, it's complicated. <laughs> and there is a danger in a single hopeless story about Nigeria today. And sadly, that is the single story that most Nigerians tell. And, and by proxy, it's the story mostly told about Nigeria, particularly in Nigeria. Yet, in spite of all the known and unknown problems in our recent past, acrimonious and highly divisive elections, high inflation, high poverty levels, insecurity, and SARS, we are a resilient people, and Nigerians are doing great things, home and abroad. To mention a few, I could just go on and on, just look at the slides. We have our unicorns, we have our creative sector. Many of the previous speakers have mentioned all these. So I'll go straight to where I want to rest my premise today. How should we then live? We've seen the predictions about this potential, potential. There was a time I started disliking the word potential because when do we get to actuality? When we spend so many years saying Nigeria is on the cusp of we have this potential, but it was based on data, it was based on facts. And then we've seen how things took the wrong direction. Rather than going this way like the Asian tigers, we went this way. How should we then live? I want to talk a bit about the making of great nations, because I believe that understanding how great nations are made can help us in navigating how we should move forward. Our struggle, though unique to us, is perhaps paradoxically similar in many ways to the bumpy road traveled by developed nations from ancient civilizations till present day on their quest to greatness. The challenge of leadership is a perennial one. From time immemorial, models of leadership, leading with integrity, and centered leadership have been the quest of many great leaders. Indeed, the question of how to achieve the good society has occupied the thoughts of leaders and thinkers in the caliber of Aristotle, Plato, Ibn Khaldun, Hobbes, Karl Marx, up to modern day economists like Joseph Stiglitz. They have considered the very essence of human nature, liberty and rights, equality and dignity, how to engender collective prosperity. I will undoubtedly be with us from time to come. So these challenges that Nigeria is going through are not new, are not unique. We have our own peculiarities, but this is the path to greatness, and we must ride this tide to get there. From a governance perspective, in broad strokes for all developing nations and African countries would not be an exception. There are perhaps, I will say, three essentials to note as key enablers. Governments need to ensure the rule of law and security, need to invest in human capital and all its ramifications, and unlock the space for private sector investment and job creation, broad strokes. While at a global level, there are many known, tried, and tested policies, there are well-curated and effective implementation plans which can take us to the promised land, arguably, it is at this intersection of the public and private sector that the real magic occurs. Looking at the newly developed countries in this area, 
and we've heard about Bangladesh, we can look about at Singapore, we can look at India, China. Governments have never done this alone. I'm privileged to be currently interrogating many of these very pertinent issues with some of the clearest thinkers from all over the world as a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Mosaraveni uh, Center for Business and Government. And I say this because we need to interrogate, and I'm so proud of the lineup of speakers that Covenant Nation has had today because you will see that repeatedly the themes that are coming through are actually, there's no shortcut, there's no other way. The path to nation building is a path that we must embrace with courage and follow through to the end. So renewed hope is Nigeria on the move. There are very many things that we can discuss in this regard. But at the end of it all, from ancient to modern times, it appears that the building blocks of every great nation are its people, its people. Is Nigeria on the move? Is your glass half empty or half full today? As we think about Nigeria's independence, just a snapshot in our year, is your glass half empty or half full with everything going on? Do we carry our own weather? How do we perceive things? Is it half empty or half full? Is Nigeria on the move? Are you on the flight, bumpy as it may be, or watching from ground zero? The present and the future of this country is in each of our hands. This is a recurring theme I speak about, and I don't think I'm ever going to change it. Talk is really cheap. If you aren't part of the solution, then frankly, you're part of the problem. And we, the people, are all captains of our own ship. And this includes our steering of Nigeria, along with our steering of our lives. We are the women and men who built Nigeria. That's what I talked about the last time I was on this podium. One of my greatest mentors, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, famously says, if your dreams don't scare you, then frankly, they aren't big enough. Yesterday, a group of about 15 young Nigerian volunteers and I kicked off the No Limits Nigeria Initiative. It's a movement to inspire, to inform, and to drive impact by young Nigerians everywhere, whether in the public sector, private sector, civil society, we each have the responsibility to build our nation in whatever way we actually aren't doing anyone a favor. We are serving ourselves and our own children yet unborn. Now the question is how? So No Limits Nigeria Initiative is my initiative. I started it about 10 years ago when I was a lecturer at the University of Lagos, and then I went into public service, and I restarted it again with some of the volunteers. Some were actually my students then, and a lot of knowledge I've garnered along the way. There's nothing too small or too big to be our own contribution to nation building. How, you say, how do we do this? It's frankly easier to sit and blame others about any situation we find ourselves. It's easier to blame government, um, and it's not that government doesn't have its role and its responsibility, or others, but we actually have to start with ourselves. This may sound naive to some or simplistic to others, but historically, this has clearly shown that the disconnect between Africa's potential and its actuality, which is why I took you through that um, knowledge piece of information, is both the leaders and the followers. No one is exempt. When the dirty water splashes, it splashes on us all. When the economists can call Africa just the hopeless continent, and later, based on data, can reverse itself. That's very hard for such a credible institution. And this was based on data. When McKinsey Institute can speak to the potential of Africa, and yet we as a people are unable to catch that flight, are unable to make it actuality, then we know that we have to look inwards. We have to really say, what is going on here? We need motivation and determination as individuals and then as a collective, a collective consciousness to make Nigeria and Africa great. We actually 
the elite, if we're watching this, if we're sitting in a room like this or online, if we're listening to this caliber of presentations, frankly, I always told my students, the fact that you're in a law classroom at University of Lagos makes you an elite. Being an elite is not about money, it's about opportunities and exposure. So we, the elite, need to come together and decide that we want to make Nigeria and Africa great. Whatever agitates you the most may be a clue as to what problem you were born to solve. Please take a minute to ask yourself, what are you doing to build Nigeria? Not the government, not somebody else, not anyone else. No long story, just you. What are you doing today? What have you done in the last month, week, year, 10 years to contribute to nation building? Even if it's picking up rubbish, even if it's not taking a one way, what have you done to make sure that this society is moving in the right direction? I'm a firm believer of not asking others to do what I'm not prepared to do myself. So in my own case, you all know, or many of you know, I've worked on industry trade and investment, I've worked on uh, African continental free trade area, global supply chains are important, productivity, you've heard very elucidated comments on that. We need to improve the supply. We talk about foreign exchange, it's a, it's a supply problem. Expanding the pie. My own story, many of you would know, it's about public service. Having been a lecturer, I put up my hand to go into government and I served for eight years. Working on PEBEC, some of you would know the reforms, and working on ease of doing business, and just working with small and medium-sized enterprises to enable businesses to scale and to prosper and to create jobs. I consider it a privilege and an honor to have served Nigerians for eight years in the previous administration, and again to be deemed worthy of the opportunity to serve by President Tinubu and Vice President Shatima. And it's simply a choice it's simply a choice. I think you should clap for the administration, not for me. Because it's a choice to stay focused. It's a choice not to stay complaining, but to keep on doing the work, regardless of emotions, regardless of sentiments. I've said to you from ancient civilizations till today, and it wouldn't stop happening, the challenge of leadership, the challenge of governance will continue. How do we then respond? Do we complain and argue and fight ourselves, or do we all bind together to deliver the Nigeria that we want to see? We'll be counting on your support, my team and I, to make sure that we can deepen the reforms, and we'll be looking for champions in the private sector to support as we go forward and develop our economy in the right direction. In conclusion, Nigeria is an important economic catalyst for Africa, as well as a stabilizing force in the region. We possess the economic and geopolitical influence to drive regional integration and development. As we celebrate Nigeria's Independence Day, let us individually and collectively recognize Nigeria's immense potential and play a strategic role in the rise of Africa. Let us act on it. If Nigeria gets it right, Africa gets it right. In the book of Nehemiah, each person built the portion of the wall in front of them. It's really that simple. As President Barack Obama once said to the Americans, in the face of impossible odds, people who love this country can change it. Please permit me to share these same words with you all today. I thank you for your attention. Good afternoon.